Okay, so we have uh, a number of items to go through before we can get to the agenda. This is our, our first meeting, our organizing meeting for this year. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing is um, item 1C, setting the MPC mini meeting. Sorry, I guess before we start that, we should go through um, we should go through the uh, guidelines for this uh, virtual meeting. Um, first thing, I'll, uh, I'll introduce the commissioners and the planning staff who are participating in today's meeting. Uh, we have Paul Clark, who's a council representative, Lynn Ralston, who's a public member, Kevin Hebb, who's a public member, Joss Elford, who's a council representative, I'm Terry Jevney, a public member, and chair Jan Thompson uh, who spoke earlier is our development officer uh, Jared Castle I believe is on the line is our director of planning Joy Tavares yes, was, morning would be our recording secretary and Leslie Ray is our facilitator in uh, previous MPC meetings we've had we've experienced a few connectivity problems that caused participants to leave the meeting briefly and log back in. There were no major problems and we successfully completed the agenda. It's important that we consider all discussion points and verbal information in order to make the best decisions and it may take more time in this format to make to to hear or to ensure all comments are heard and understood. I ask all participants to be patient as we work through any technology interruptions that we might experience. So there are a number of protocols that we put in place for these virtual meetings. First, we'll uh, no new written material will be accepted at the meeting. Applicants will be able to present verbally, but no documents will be accepted that were not previously submitted. We'll take short breaks at appropriate times over the course of the meeting and potentially a 30 minute lunch break. During a break, a sign will be displayed on your screen saying that we're on a break and how long that break will be. All participants are asked to keep their microphones muted until they are ready to speak. Applicants and their advisors are asked to leave the meeting after the application has been reviewed. If desired, they can watch the remainder of the meeting on the MD's YouTube channel. If an applicant joins the meeting later on, I'll explain the meeting procedure and ask them to mic or mute their microphone. In the event that a participant loses their internet or the connection degrades so that they can't hear or be heard, they will leave the meeting and rejoin. When that happens, we may take a short break or at least stop for the discussion of the agenda item until the participant is back. If after five minutes they haven't rejoined and we still have a quorum of three members, we'll continue the discussion. If the participant rejoins after the discussion is resumed, we will bring them up to date and carry on. If the participant is an MPC member and we judge that too much information has been discussed in the interim, or we are in the process of voting, that member may be asked to abstain from the vote. If we lose a quorum and it's not reestablished within 30 minutes, the meeting is deemed adjourned and any unfinished business will be brought forward to the next meeting. A loss of video doesn't require a participant to leave the meeting. As long as participants can hear and be heard, they will be actively participating in the meeting. If I, as chair, lose my connection and can't rejoin, Lynn Ralston will assume the chair so that as long as we have a quorum of three members, the meeting can continue without further delay. We will use our normal meeting procedure where a staff member will review the application and the staff recommendation. Commissioners will ask questions of staff. Commissioners will engage the applicants and the applicants will have an opportunity to speak to their application. At the appropriate point, in the discussion, I will ask other attendees to who claim to be affected by the application to address the commission. All comments must be made through the chair, not to, to the applicant or the MD staff. They will have five minutes to make their statement. Note that anyone speaking on behalf of another person or organization must have submitted a letter of consent from that person or organization or they won't be allowed to speak. At the completion of their statement, commissioners may have questions of the affected person but MPC will not debate the application with members of the public. MPC's role is to gather information and make a decision. Applicants and affected members of the public 
have the option to appeal NPC decisions to the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board if they so choose. When the questions and discussion begin, all participants are asked to use the raise hand function in Teams. I'll do my best to acknowledge the raised hands in the order that they're received, uh, the order that they're raised. If a participant has joined by telephone so that the raised hand function is not available, please wait for a break in the discussion and address the chair. Other than from applicants, no questions will be entertained unless there are questions relating to the process or procedure. I ask the participants not bring up any new point of discussion until I acknowledge that no further discussion on a current point. Once the discussion is complete, I'll ask for a motion and respond to the first raised hand that I see. To ensure that the main minutes are accurate and there's no confusion about the vote, will we use a roll call during the vote? I will call for the vote in the same order each time. First, Paul Clark, then Lynn Ralston, then Kevin Hebb, then Joss Alford, and I will vote last. I'll refer to the motion at the start of the roll call and ask the question, are you in favor of the motion? I ask that you answer yes or no. At the end of the roll call, I'll state whether the motion was passed or refused and check with Joy that she's heard all the votes. So with that, we'll start into the agenda. Or I'll, we'll proceed with the agenda, I guess. So item 1C is setting the MPC dates and times. Uh, is there any uh, reason to want to do other than what we've done in the past, which is the third Wednesday of the month? If I'll make a motion, Terry. Thanks, Lynn. So we have a motion to set MPC meeting dates as the third Wednesday of the month or on the time of 9 in the morning, 9 a.m. Yep. Um, so, uh, Paul Clark, are you in favor? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. And Lynn? Yes. And Joss? Yes. And I'm in favor. Uh, Joy, did you catch that? So the motion's carried? Yes, I did. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, so item D, uh, 1D, select the MPC meeting procedure. Um, in the last number of years, we've gone with, I believe it's option one. Um, any discussion? If not, uh, we have a motion. Kevin? You're still... Kevin, you're still muted. Yeah, I move. We keep the same procedures we have been using. And I'm same as you. I think it's procedure one. OK, very good. Um, so we have a motion to uh, to adopt uh, procedure one for this uh, for this following year. Paul Clark, are you in favor? You're muted, Paul. OK, I got you. Uh, Kevin? Yes. And Lynn? Yes. And Joss? Yeah, yes. And I'm in favor. The motion's carried. Joy, did you catch that? I did. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, man. OK, uh, the agenda for this meeting. Any uh, Any changes? Uh, Mr. Chairman, there are no yep. changes proposed by administration, but I did want to just remind members that after your agenda package was sent out, uh, there were some submissions that were received that aren't in your package. We have sent them to you previously yesterday. Uh, today, when you're discussing item VA3, uh, which is the Colbray Amendment application, you'll need to formally accept those letters so that they become part of your agenda and part of the minutes. So when okay. we get to item uh, VA3, I'll remind you of that again. Excellent. Thanks, Jen. Uh, so we have no changes. Can I have a motion for the to adopt the agenda? Joss? A motion to take the agenda, adopt the agenda. Thank you. Uh, so, Paul Clark, do you 
proof? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. And Lynn? Yes. And Joss? And I approve. So motion's carried. Uh, Joy, did you catch that? Yes, I did. Thank you. And so item three, approval of the minutes of October 20th meeting. Any changes? I'll make the motion, Terry. Thanks, Lynn. <clears throat> so we have a motion to approve the minutes of October 20th. Paul Clark, do you approve? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. And Lynn? Yes. And Joss? Yes. And I approve, so motion's carried. Joy, did you catch that? Yes, I did. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, um, so let's move to the applications. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, business right for minutes, item four, we have uh, we have nothing. So, um, 5A1, Jan, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this application is for an extension and it's been submitted by the Exshaw Heritage Society, care of the chairperson, Linda Grishkat. Ms. Grishkat was unable to attend the meeting today, but she did say she would be available by phone if there were any questions. The extension, the extension, excuse me, request is the third extension request by the society. To give you a little bit of background, the Exshaw Heritage Society was formed to try and save the 1907 portion of the St. Bernard's Catholic Church to find a permanent location for it and preserve it as a heritage building. The church was originally situated in Exshaw on the Lafarge cement plant uh, plant site near the Exshaw school. When Lafarge was expanding back in 2014, the area where the church sat was needed by Lafarge. So notice was given that the church needed to be removed from the property. Given the church had some heritage significance, the, a number of Exshaw community members committed to trying to save the church and to find a permanent location for it. Graymont Western Canada Inc. stepped up and agreed to let the Heritage Society store the church on some property that it owns in Northwest Section 25, Township 24, Range 9. This is the land that's adjacent to the Francis Cook Regional Landfill site. It's near the 1A Highway and just east of Exshaw. The Society applied for a development permit for the temporary storage of the church on Graymont's land. The MD of Bighorn approved that development permit uh, for the temporary storage of the church for a three-year term. That is, until October 13, 2017. This was to allow the society time to find a permanent home for the church and to sort out all the logistics around that. Prior to expiry of the October 13, 2017 date, the society requested and was approved for a three-year extension to that permit. The permit was extended by MPC until October 13, 2020. This was extension number one. As part of the extension application, a project update was provided to the MPC by the society as a progress report and as justification for the extension. The society's efforts continued in finding a location for the church, but three years went by pretty quick and a second extension was requested. MPC at its October 21st, 2020 meeting approved the second extension. And again, with the first extension, a project update was provided by the society outlining the status of the project. The latest update is fairly grim. Uh, the society hasn't been able to find a permanent site for the church. So this final third extension to the permit is for one more year to find time, or I'm sorry, to provide time for the society to either find a permanent site or to wind down the effort and work out details for demolition of the structure. An updated project report for 2021 was included in your agenda package. 
Greymont has consented to use of its land uh, as a temporary storage site for the church. The consent letter provided at extension number two was Greymont's approval for a three-year extension, but only one year was granted. So the society still has two years of consent, I guess, from Greymont for the church to be stored there. In short, the society or the uh, Greymont has given the society permission to store the church there until 2023. The staff recommendation is for approval of this of this third extension until October 13th, 2022. That's the end of my presentation, but I can answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Jan. Any questions for Jan, Lynn? So, Jan, I see Graymont was willing to do up to three years. Is there any reason why we wouldn't just let it go for three years, or are they wrapping things up in a year, and that's why we're only going to go a year? They're wrapping things up. Um, they've just asked for only one year. They haven't been successful in finding a site, so now they have to, um, I guess, get a plan together on demolishing it. Um, I may probably getting some assistance doing that with local businesses, maybe, but they are only asking for one year, even though they have two years left uh, of Graymont's approval to keep it there. So there's no reason to give them the extra two years in your mind? Well, they haven't asked for it. Um, I think if you give them a year and they come back for another year, um, I guess we would be, you'd be at that stage deciding on that. So uh, it, okay. it's up to MPC. They're only asking for one year. All right. Thanks. Kevin. Kevin, you're muted still. <clears throat> That's twice I've managed that today. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to extend it to two years because often things do not proceed as quickly as they anticipate. And uh, I'd just like to save them the trip back since they have permission from Graymont. So my motion is to, uh, uh, to make it a two-year extension, not the one as applied for. Thanks, Kevin. Any other discussion? So Graymont was up to three years, though, Kevin. You're aware of that? Uh, but they've already used up one of it, is what I understood from Jan's report. Oh, okay, right. If there's no other discussion, we have a motion to extend um, for two years. Uh, or, or Jan, uh, if it was, does, does this go back a year? I'm not sure I caught that. Um, the, uh uh, maybe it doesn't matter. So the extension is, the, the motion is to extend for two years from today. And that's, right. I guess that's all we need to do. Um, so, uh, Paul Clark, do you approve? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. And Lynn? Yes. And Josh? Yes. And I approve, so the motion's carried. Uh, Joy, did you catch that? Yes, I did. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good, thank you. Excuse me. Okay, so let's move to 5A2. And Jan, whenever you're ready. Uh, sorry, just before we start, um, we have Thomas Tyler and, and uh, Travis Coates are both here. Yes, okay. Morning. Jan, go ahead. Are you ready? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This application is submitted by Thomas Tyler on behalf of Burnco. And as the chairman outlined, two representatives from Burnco are in attendance today. The application is for the renewal of a natural resource extraction operation, uh, which would be the extraction of sand and gravel. The previous approval for the operation Development Permit 12 slash 16 expired on February 8, 2018. The subject site is a lease area in what is commonly referred to as the public lands pit area. The province of Alberta owns this land. The pit area is located near the 1X junction. A location map is within your agenda package showing you where the property is located. This site has been leased to Burnco by way of SML 840003. The lease has been renewed 
and the new expiry for the lease is June 24, 2031. The size of the lease area is 26.53 acres, having been reduced from 35.99 acres due, a, due to a provincial land exchange arrangement with the MD of Bighorn. The land is designated as Natural Resource Extraction District, and the application is for a natural resource extraction operation, and uh, natural resource extraction is listed as a discretionary use in the NR District. So the application has been submitted to the MPC for consideration. The land use bylaw in section 4.2 and 42.17 address natural resource extraction and the regulations associated with that use. Bernco has not commenced any extraction at the site as yet, but could commence at any time. Bernco has held this lease area since approximately 1984. Attached in the background information are the mining excavation drawings, which are showing how the extraction would be accomplished once it was commenced. Some of these submitted drawings and the site plans will form schedules to any permit that MPC may issue today. There's also a reclamation plan attached as approved by the province. The application sets out potential future development of a scale house, a way scale, and other structures such as fuel storage tanks or um, you know, temporary asphalt plants, etc. The staff recommendation outlines that any future buildings or infrastructure be applied for separately once those structures are required and renderings are finalized. MPC can change this recommendation should it wish. The staff recommendation also outlines that the sand and gravel extraction could be renewed for a period of up to 10 years as per section 4.2.2 of the land use bylaw. Note that the renewal time frame of 10 years was calculated from when the previous permit expired. So, for example, um, the time frame was calculated from February 8, 2018 and forward 10 years. The new expiry date is proposed to be February 8, 2028, should MPC agree with that time frame. The land use bylaw in Table 1 of Section 3.15 requires one parking stall per employee and five stalls for a visitor. And this is required to be provided on site. Given the site is not active currently, there's no employees or visitors attending the site, compiled with the fact that the site is some 26 acres, a specific parking plan was not required to be provided by Burnco, showing that parking can be provided on the site. It was thought that due to the size of the lease area, the parking isn't going to be an issue and it can be easily provided on site. If MPC would rather see a parking plan on how that's going to be laid out, you may certainly ask for it. The land use bylaw also requires that with all discretionary use applications, adjacent landowners are required to be notified. In this location, there aren't any adjacent landowners other than the province of Alberta and other long-standing SML leaseholders. It was felt that requiring notification to these adjacent leaseholders wasn't necessary. MPC may require notification to be affected though, if you disagree with this. The staff recommendation is for approval, subject to the conditions that are outlined in the staff recommendation. And that concludes my presentation, and I'm available to answer any questions. And again, as you heard, uh, we have two representatives from Burnco here today that can also answer questions. Thanks, Jan. Uh, so, do we have questions? Paul, you've got your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two questions, uh, Jen. Uh, is not uh, Brewster Kananaskis Ranch and Golf Course an adjacent landowner? They are adjacent, um, but they're quite removed from there. Uh, but again, like I said, it, it didn't seem like notification was uh, required for this Burnco application due to the distance. But I can, but we can notify people sh um, should you wish, for example. Um, a copy of this notice of decision or any decision of MPC today could be sent to um, some of the uh, adjacent properties that are further away, should you wish. 
OK, thank you. A second question is that um, has this uh, project been uh, approved by Alberta Environment? Uh, yes, there. Well, there's been a lease issued by the province to Burnco for this mineral extraction operation, and they've had approval for some time, but they have not commenced the extraction yet. But yes, it's been approved by the province. Thank you. One of the questions I had, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Paul. Lynn. Um, probably a question more for the uh, applicants, but uh, submitted as part of this was on pages 46 to 50, the reclamation, 51 reclamation plans, and there's like A through E. I'd just like a better explanation of what those actually represent because I couldn't quite figure them out. And the other question for Jan is, uh, were there any, or have there been any complaints about any of this over the years? No, there have been no complaints regarding this operation um, that we are aware of. Okay, thank you. Let's hold the question on reclamation, uh, reclamation uh, till we hear from Kevin, and then I'll, I'll come back to the applicants. Kevin? I just have the same concern that Paul expressed. I think the close by neighbors, even though they aren't extremely close by, should be notified. I know houses are there in the area, and uh, I forget who lives in the other house across the highway a short distance. Yeah, I just like them notified so they know what's going on. I don't see it as a problem with okay with the permit but just letting the neighbors know what's happening i think is considerate on the md's part so can we just do that jan then we'll we'll say that uh ipc would like you to send the notification sure um and just for clarity so i th what i heard is um there's two residences that are in um you know nearby so that's not a problem. We can send to those private landowners. Did you also want um, the Kananaskis Guest Ranch to be in that uh, included in that notification? Mm, yes, I think we might as well include them since they are in proximity. Sure. Okay. No problem. I can make. I can provide a copy of any decision today to those three. Uh, those three people. Okay. Thank you. I don't see and, any need for a motion. Okay, and then uh, just lastly, did did you feel that the adjacent lessee should be notified as well, or just these um, two two private residences that are, um, I guess, in the area? Uh, the two private ones were my greatest concern, but okay. I'm certainly not opposed to letting the golf course know as well. Okay. Okay. okay, I'll make a note of that. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Thomas and Travis, um, there's a question that came up about the uh, about the reclamation, but uh, would, do you want to go ahead and, and uh, just explain uh, what you're doing and then at some point address that reclamation question? Sure, yeah. Thank you for the question, Lynn. Um, if it's okay, I might get a little bit more information from you on what you're, you know, a little bit more specifics on that question. I'm just trying to, you know, look through our corp application here, and I want to make sure we're address, addressing your question properly. Um, so uh, we, we have had the site for a number of years. Uh, due to market conditions and our existing site over at Canmore, we haven't really needed to uh, open up the site until until now. Um, with that being said, we have we've, we would have liked to have it opened up a little earlier, but due to um, the land exchange kind of delayed us by a few years. We couldn't get a development permit because we didn't have our corp application completed. Um, that, so that's definitely set us back a little bit here. Um, so with our reduced area, um, we, we've kind of broken it down into a three phase uh, development. We're gonna be opening up phase one when we're able to have approvals and get into the site. Uh, phase two and three will be coming at a later date here. Um, reclamation will occur progressively. So from phase one, we have uh, two soil piles that'll be kind of near, near the southern edge of phase two and three. Um, that Once that area has been mined out, topsoil and subsoil overburden from phase two will be placed directly into phase one um, as part of that progressive reclamation. 
that just limits our total disturbed area impact on you know the wildlife um, helps allow us to seed and plant trees at an earlier date which can also help with um, kind of the sound dust and visual impacts of our development so yeah we're and we're, we're predicting or about 15,000 tons on an, for an average year. That's definitely going to be dependent on um, local projects in the Canmore area, mainly um, our existing site over by, uh, near Canmore there. And I guess the final kind of bit of information maybe, is our operating hours. We've proposed and been approved for uh, seven to seven as a, a typical hauling hours. Again, local projects, scheduling of that might change that. Um, and then our crusher will only be there for a temporary period during on a year-to-year -year basis. Might not even be every year. It's just going to be dependent again on market conditions. And we've uh, proposed seven to seven for that as well. So we're going, you know, um, not 24 hours by any means, just uh, seven to seven, seven days a week. And yeah, uh, Lynn, if you don't mind, could you give me a bit more uh, information on your question? And I hope I can answer that for you too. I just wanted to understand the diagram. So there's a schedule A. Um, that has what ADE reclamation pictures, existing site and reclaim site. Just curious to know what those are in terms of relation to the site. Okay, I'm I'm trying to find. I don't have a, um, a, a A section in my report. Maybe that was one through administration, but we we do have an existing site, kind of a site plan there overview that is just showing. Um, what it currently is, what the site is looking at right now, vegetation that's there. Um, there's also a, look, a spring in the kind of the eastern side there that we've tried to highlight. Uh, Here, actually, I'll have... show you on camera. This might help you. Does this look familiar? Okay. Yeah. What are yeah, these? So those, are our, those are our cross sections. So okay. basically what, what that shows is that the orange area, that's the yeah. aggregate gravel, sand and gravel reserve. Um, it also shows elevation. So you can see, you know, 316 meters on the top, all the way down to 1305. So we've got okay. roughly 10 to 11 meters of material there that we'd like to remove or that is available. And then if you look at a reclaimed site condition, that's along the same line there. So from A to A, which you can actually go, if you go up to, we should have a site, overall site plan. I'll try and find it for you. Um, yeah, because I couldn't tie that to the picture. I just didn't know what the connection was. So could you see um, reclamation plan? It'll be drawing number five. It should be two drawings above the one you're currently looking at. I think that's page 56 then. Okay. Just drawing five. Yeah, drawing five, CB reclamation plan. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to look at, if you can see on that one, A uh, okay. yeah. to A, um, and then we can go down and look at the cross section. So what we're showing here are the current, I guess, below ground conditions, aggregate, overburden. Um, and then the, the reclaimed drawing is after we've mined it out, we're going to be placing some topsoil back. That's that little bit of a, a green on the top there. And then okay. the, the, the gray part is our backfiller overburden material. So that'll be the final um, existing grade of the site. So you Great. can see that we've taken roughly, you know, six meters of material out. There is still a, a reserve below it, but quality um, and I, I guess overall end grade has to be acceptable too. So we've left that portion in there. And then A, yep. B, C, D, and E are all just different cross sections of the site. Great. Thanks. That, that helps me understand. Okay. So Thomas, this uh, was all presented to, to get your extension of the uh, from, from environment? Of the lease? Yeah, so our corp application was submitted to Alberta Environment. Brian Allen, local lands officer, has reviewed that and we have a, a verbal approval through him. Uh, we're just waiting on the final documentation, but we do have uh, a, an approved lease with Alberta Environment that is saying that we are able to operate at the site pending development permit through the MD of Bighorn and the approval of our corp, which again, we should have. I should have had it last week, but hoping, you know, right away here for sure. Okay. Any other uh, discussion? I've got a couple, Terry. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, two questions, uh, Thomas. Uh, one is, do you recover the subsoil as well? As well as the topsoil? Yeah, so the topsoil and subsoil will, will be separated separately it'll be stripped 
separately, sorry. Um, and as you can see in phase two and three there, we have two berms. One will be a topsoil or a pile, sorry. One will be a topsoil pile and one will be a subsoil pile. So they're separate. Um, they'll be seeded immediately after and they'll be used in the, um, the final reclamation of the site. Uh, second question is, uh, I, I, uh, it may be in the document, uh, but uh, I uh, didn't uh, see it. Is, do, do you have a traffic uh, control uh, study done? So yeah. we, we, we haven't done an updated uh, traffic impact assessment and we're, we're kind of of the belief, you know, we're only 15,000 tons, which is a very minimal volume for gravel pit. We're surrounded by, you know, a half dozen minimum in operation right now. So our footprint's going to be quite minor. Um, you know, it's a renewal, so it was approved even up to 2018. So we're, we're of the belief that you know, our impact's going to be negligible at best for sure in terms of truck traffic. Yeah, there's a lot of traffic on there uh, already from uh, Lafarge. For sure, and those okay, are, thank yeah, thanks. So if I understand that correctly, your your access is going to the northeast through through another lease and then out on that uh, on that gravel road. So is that right? we'll be exiting from in the northeast corner of our location. We currently have a DLO that we're in conjunction with uh, Lehigh Hansen because they have an SML further east. Right. So we're both on title for that DLO. That'll be accessed uh, directly north from our site and then we'll be using that common a uh, road out of there, uh, access yeah. to the west to 1A, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Any other? Uh, Paul, you still have your hand up? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I okay. didn't take uh, it down. Thank you. If uh, Kevin. Uh, I was just wondering if we should add the condition in there then that if the volume of truck traffic out of that pit becomes greater than anticipated by the applicant uh, that we should put in requirement that a, a proper road study be done at that time. Is that necessary in anybody else's view or? Uh, I think is, is it not the case that uh, what's proposed is going to take up all the available uh, uh, material from that site. Okay, uh, there's no room to expand any further than what you're proposing, is there? Uh, sorry, a question. Would you like me so, to answer that, Terry? Yeah, please. I mean, like we are, we do have a, a set volume in there. Um, you know, year to year, um, I guess volumes coming out could 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 differ depending on local projects. Again, even the high end compared to the low end would be be quite minor. I mean, there are a half dozen other active pits there that are utilizing that same access road, which is purely for extraction purposes and then onto, you know, a, a main AT highway. So, the, you know, our, our, our footprint will be quite minor even relative to our adjacent neighbors there. And then, you know, we're, it's, uh, we're only utilizing a road that's only there for, for this type of development. And then we're getting onto a, you know, an AT primary secondary highway. So we're, we're definitely of the belief that um, minimal impact, minimal impacts for sure with not much room for, you know, increases or decreases based off of that average. So if that. Okay. So, so our, our next question would be, th there was a traffic study done for the previous uh, application and would the amount of traffic uh, for this extension <coughs> change, like the, the basis of that previous study would be expected to change? Maybe I'll let Travis kind of touch base on the traffic on this question. He might have a bit more, you know, historical knowledge of it than I, than I do, but. Yeah, th thanks, Tom. Um, I, I don't really have a whole lot to add, to be honest, uh, you know, it has been a long time since traffic was looked at at this site. Uh, as has been mentioned, we're coming out on a common road shared with, you know, eight other gravel producers. So, you know, evaluating 
uh, our traffic impact in this area is, is going to be a bit tricky where we'd have to figure out what uh, traffic volume those other sites are generating, what um, contribution our truck traffic might add to that, and then uh, evaluating you know the various impacts of that uh, you know could be tricky. As, as Thomas says, this is uh, eastbound on on the one A or I guess north uh, on the when you're coming on the one X. This is uh, north uh, towards the reservation, so there's not a lot of of vehicle traffic on this section of road. This is an area primarily focused for gravel production, as Thomas said. Um, so. Uh, you know, we're of the opinion that a, a truck traffic uh, impact assessment uh, is is not warranted, and it would be a, a very tricky item to try to produce uh, if it was requested. But but we could certainly give it a shot. Kevin, uh, is anybody else on the committee the least bit concerned about the traffic impact? Uh, it certainly sounds to me as if. This company is not anticipating any significant impact on that area, and I, I'm inclined to go with that unless somebody else is is also concerned. I think I'd agree with that, Kevin. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for answering my questions to the best of your ability, and uh, yeah, I'm satisfied with that. Paul. Yeah, I, I'm the chairman of the Streets and Roads Committee, and uh, uh, so that's the, that's always a concern for us is the in, increased traffic and uh, traffic flow. So I think the question has been answered well, and uh, I'm fine with it. Okay, thanks. Any other discussion? If not, can we have a motion? I'll make the motion to chairman. Okay, so staff this is, uh, yeah, motion to approve staff recommendation. Uh, with the uh, uh, with the uh, requirements to uh, notify uh, Jason uh, landholders. Right, thank you. Okay, so a motion to approve staff recommendation, uh, including the request earlier on to uh, notify staff uh, adjacent landholders. Uh, Paul Clark, do you approve? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. And Lynn? Yes. And Joss? Yes. And I approve, so the motion is carried. Uh, thanks, uh, Travis and Thomas. You're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. And Joy, did you catch that? Yes, I did. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to move to 5A3. Uh, and just before we start that, I, we have a lot of people who want to participate in this discussion. So I'd like to just clarify, make sure I understand who's here. Um, just as a reminder for everyone who's um, interested in this application that uh, we'll be following the same procedure that uh, you've just seen. We'll hear first from uh, from Jan about uh, the background and, and staff recommendation, and then uh, there may be questions. Uh, once we've um, addressed that with uh, with the applicants and uh, and APC is is satisfied with what they're hearing, um, then I will come to the uh, members of the public who have asked to speak. Uh, so I'd like to just check before we start about who's here and who's not here. So on my list, I have uh, Shepard Steiner, and I don't see that person anywhere. So if, uh, I mean, if he or she shows up later on, then we'll entertain that. Uh, Bob Nobrega, I see is here. Uh, Joseph Wells, yes. Uh, Jason Leo Bantel. I don't see there. Um, Howard Hepburn. Yes, okay. 
and uh, Laura Clippingdale. I don't see Laura here. And Allison Hepburn, or I guess, is Allison a separate uh, speaker? She would be a separate speaker. Okay, thank you. I don't see her on list. Um, or is this the same Hepburn as Howard? Mr. Chairman, uh, just to clarify, it's Howard Hepburn yep. speaking. Um, I'm representing as president of the Herbie Heights Community Association uh, that interest and uh, right. uh, any personal other interests would uh, be coming from my sister, Alison Hepburn, unrelated in other ways to me. Thank you. Is, is uh, Howard, is she with you? Because I don't see her in this meeting. No, uh, she is not with me. So uh, I, I haven't heard uh, uh, that she was planning to attend. Oh, okay. Um, I was given, she's on our list of someone who wanted to speak. Um, okay. So once we've, uh, again, once we've gone through the uh, background and, um, and the applicants have had a choice to speak, then we'll come back to uh, those of you who wish to address this. And uh, as a reminder, uh, you'll have five minutes to uh, make your statement. And um, there may be questions from commissioners after that. But uh, at that point, then we'll move on to the next uh, person. Okay, thanks uh, everybody for listening to that. Jan, do you wanna go ahead? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This application is submitted by Chris Wallace on behalf of Kelly and Elaine Thompson, the landowners. The landowners have consented in writing for Mr. Wallace to act as their agent. Uh, and both Mr. Wallace and the Thompsons are here today. The application is for amendments to development permit number 07 slash 21, which was issued for a single detached dwelling with a front yard setback variance and a slope setback variance at 405 Bow River Drive. The project also included demolition of the existing dwelling. The amendment came about due to changes that had been made during construction. The MD first became aware of inconsistencies between the issued permit and the actual construction from area neighbors and the community association. These initial letters of concern are contained within the background material. It was after receipt of a few letters of concern citing the permit was not being followed that the MD of Bighorn contacted the developer for clarity. A real property report was, was requested to confirm the position of the house on the lot and to verify the height of the building. Pictures and revised elevation drawings were requested to reflect changes for comparison to those that were approved in the permit. Upon review of the submissions, it was determined that an amendment application was required. MD staff then worked with the agent to get the amendment application submitted. The amendment application is contained within the agenda package and much of the revised drawings and site plans will form schedules to any permit that's issued today. And these would replace um, previously approved versions. As stated above, the property is located at 405 Bow River Drive in the hamlet of Harvey Heights. This property is one of the unique properties in Harvey Heights, which has its lot oriented differently than others in the hamlet. In this case, the rear yard is considered to be to Bow River Drive. The front yard is to the power line. Land use bylaw section 12.5 sets us out. There's some confusion in the application and even some of the responses as to which is the front and which is the rear yard. So please be mindful when you're reading or hearing from people um, to ensure that the orientation is correct. Since the original development permit 0721 was issued, there were changes that occurred during construction and new items were added. The agent's cover letter sets these out, but the changes are generally the house was constructed higher out of the ground, which resulted in a front at grade patio becoming a raised front deck. A new retaining wall has been proposed in the front yard, and this is all on the power line side. 
an additional front yard setback variance is being requested for the existing decks. And a revised site plan has been provided showing the final location of the septic tank and also the new retaining wall position. The revised site plan also showed the new location of the dwelling on the property. Originally, it was thought that a rear yard setback variance would be needed, and this is a variance to the Bow River Drive side, um, because the a site plan that had been submitted by the agent showed that there was encroachment. However, the real property report that was submitted shows that the rear yard setback to Bow River Drive complies with the eight meter setback. No rear yard variance is deemed necessary. The height of the dwelling of, is of concern and couldn't be verified by a surveyor as requested by the MD. And this is because it was stated that the final grades had not been established yet. And a letter verifying this from the, from the surveyor is in your agenda package. Instead, a grade plan was provided showing what the existing grades are. The staff recommendation sets out that the height of the dwelling must not exceed nine meters. Um, that's in recommendation number 12. If MPC wish to have this height verified by a survey right away, you could add a clause to reckon recommendation number 12 requesting that. At this stage of construction, it's unclear if the nine meter maximum height will be achieved at the front of the dwelling on the power line side, although the agent has stated, stated that the height will be achieved. One of the concerns expressed by the neighbors is that the changes in the differing grades have resulted in the decks being higher than originally proposed, and that this is a direct result from the house being built out of the ground more than proposed. In short, these issues are caused due to non-compliance with the permit. Neighbors are concerned with the height of the dwelling and that the views are now being obstructed. Pictures have been provided of the existing situation so that MP MPC have a visual uh, rendering of what the, the property looks like. With respect to the additional front yard setback variance, the agent has outlined that there were measurement errors which resulted in the front decks encroaching beyond the one meter variance that was granted by the MPC at the original approval of development permit 0721. Originally, the variance was to a 6.5 meter setback. The actual front yard setback for the decks is 4.92 meters. So an additional variance is being requested by the applicant. MPC have the ability to grant up to a 30% variance to the front yard setback based on section 41.3.3 of the land use bylaw. Provided MP MPC feels that the granting of this variance would not unduly interfere with the amenities of the neighbors or materially affect the use, enjoyment, or value of neighboring parcels of land. MPC will have to make this determination and decide on the variance based on the neighbor responses to the notification, which are contained within your agenda package. Additionally, MPC will hear from some neighbors today about the effect of the changes. The full 30% variance by MPC will be needed for the existing structure to conform, thus allowing a new minimum front yard setback of 5.25 meters. Unfortunately, even with the full 30% variance, the decks will still not comply. This is because a variance can only be granted down to 5.25 meters and the actual setback is only 4.92. Accordingly, 0 0.33 meters of the front decks will need to be cut off in order to comply. The staff recommendation addresses this, and MPC are being asked to provide a date that this structural alteration should be accomplished by. A new 1.2 meter retaining wall is proposed in the front yard, complete with a guardrail. And this is shown on the new revised site plan. The retaining wall is over 0.9 of a meter in height. So the land use bylaw requires a permit for it. And that's why the, uh, the retaining wall has been included in the amendment application. The retaining wall would be constructed of Lego block as a style of construction. 
and the renderings of this are in your MPC agenda package. Administration required a letter from the original geotechnical engineer regarding the slope setback variance to confirm that the retaining wall would not compromise the slope stability or the original report prepared. This additional certifying letter is attached in your agenda package and it's from Taylor Geotechnical and generally outlines no concerns with the retaining wall construction. Administration also asked for the retaining wall drawings to be engineered. So a letter from the engineer and I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this right, Cognidin <laughs> uh, Engineering and Design. Uh, it's attached in your agenda package and it basically certifies the construction. Based on the changes proposed, new elevation drawings, a revised site plan, and a new grading plan has been provided. These will become new schedules to any permit that's issued today, replacing the old plans that are attached to development permit 0721. There's pictures also in the background information package to provide MPC with a visual rendering of the existing situation on the property. Given there's going to be some filling of the property and the installation of a retaining wall, the property will, be re will require to be sloped in a controlled manner. Um, as it uh, goes to adjacent properties. The staff recommendation outlines that grading and drainage must be completed to provide effective site drainage in accordance with section 3.9 of the land use bylaw. No site drainage will be allowed to drain onto adjacent properties. Note that some of the neighbors are concerned with this grading and they believe that the retaining wall will cause runoff problems as well as affect subsurface flows. Pictures provided show the degree of slope to adjacent properties. The grading plan has been attached to the new revised site plan as a schedule to any permit issued. But if MPC don't, the, don't feel that that grading plan is needed, it can be removed as a schedule. I just need MPC direction on that. In terms of the changes, the agent and the landowners are present today uh, to speak to the matter and can explain why there were modifications and why the patio has been substituted with a raised deck. With respect to the final location of the sewage pump out tank, it has been shown on the revised site plan. MPC is going to hear concerns today that the location may not meet the Alberta private sewage standard of practice. The MD of Bighorn cannot regulate the location of the septic tank but it can require a copy of the provincial permit for the installation. Development permit number 0721 required a copy of the sewage permit that was issued um, for the tank installation. We haven't received a copy of that yet. Um, so this staff recommendation today requires a copy of the sewage permit to be provided by December 31st of this year. If MPC wish, they can change that date. Notification of the amendment application was required to be affected to adjacent neighbors. This was accomplished by the agent and a copy of the notification that was sent out is attached in your agenda package, along with a notification map showing which properties were notified. Two neighbors were directly contacted. One neighbor was not home, so the notification was left on the door. There's a picture in your agenda package which shows this notification in the door. And one owner was emailed the notification package. Some of the neighbor responses were contained within the agenda package and others were received after the agenda package had been sent out. I alluded to this when we adopted the agenda or when you adopted the agenda. Uh, those letters were provided to MPC by email yesterday, and today MPC will need to formally accept these letters as further information, um, given they were not in your agenda package and not accepted. There are many neighbors and interested parties uh, wishing to speak to their letters today. Last, as a housekeeping item, in order to process the changes to development permit 0721, a new permit application number has been assigned. 
It was felt that rescinding the old permit and replacing it with a new amended permit would be cleaner and less confusing than having two permits for one development. The staff recommendation is for approval of the application subject to the staff recommended conditions below. Well, not below, but um, that you have in your agenda package. Note that the conditions of the original approval have been incorporated into the recommendation below, while new ones have been added and existing ones modified to reflect the new changes. New schedules are being proposed to replace the old superseded ones. And that concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Jen. So before we, uh, just before we get into uh, discussion, um, I believe all uh, members have received the uh, the letters that Jan referred to. Yeah. So we'll uh, we'll accept those then for information, Jan. And thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll go ahead with questions. Paul Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, question to uh, Jan. Uh, um, the the longer version of the one that we just received uh, uh, by email. Uh, and it's uh, uh, I don't know how to refer to it, but it's it's uh, it's a long one. It's the longest one. Uh, and my question is, who who was who was the author of that? I can't right. find any. I I there there are a couple longer uh, letters. Um, there is one letter from the Harvey Heights Community Association uh, that you know might be considered lengthy, and uh, still there is um, also one from uh, Mr. Joe Wells, uh, and uh, his is a little lengthy too. So how can we clarify? Um, they should have a signature following the letter. So, Jan, I think what Paul's referring to is the one that. Uh starts off at saying presentation to the MDA Bighorn Miss Planning Commission and it's got uh, parts A and B right and C and that mm -hmm. one I also noted that uh, there's no signature and, and no indication of who wrote this oh well all right then <laughs> um okay I see it here just one second I'm just uh I'm wondering if just the signature didn't come out no you're quite you're right there isn't so the one you're referring to um i believe this one is from the harvey heights community association no i, I believe nope. it's from sorry to interfere i'm sorry it's from joseph wells joseph yeah is that yours joseph? Uh, joseph wells. it's from joseph wells yes yeah okay thanks very much I guess my second question is, uh, uh, Jan, is uh, how does the uh, building inspector fit into this? So the MD of Bighorn is not accredited to um, issue building permits, do inspections, or have really anything to do with the Alberta Building Code or the National Building Code today. So while the MPC has the ability to approve development permits and imply, uh, impose conditions. Uh, you don't have any control over the Alberta Building Code. Those inspections or those permit issuances, those would have to be dealt with by an accredited agency or the Alberta Safety Codes um, Authority. Uh, I understand that, uh, and thank you for the clarification, but it seems... It seems to me that uh, there uh, should be some form of inspection uh, letters along the way uh, as uh, as this building progressed. So Paul, can I suggest uh, we'll uh, hold that question for for the applicants? Um, and, yeah, and, fine. Yeah. OK, and come back to that. Okay. Uh, I think uh, yeah, Lynn may have another question for Jan. Yes. Yeah, so 
Jan, out of the recommendations, I'm looking at number three and number 12, and they seem almost identical. So I'm, there's just a few last sentence difference on them, and I'm trying to understand why they're, they're two different conditions there regarding the height. Yes, I see that. And I think that was just probably a duplication. Um, you could remove, uh, let me just read them. You could probably remove number 12 because number three sets out that um, the, the height must be achieved. Um, so you could remove one of them. They both require that the maximum height of nine meters be achieved. Okay, thanks. So a second question is, if we go with three, the last sentence, I want some clarification on it says, regarding any feeling shall not affect the nine meter height requirement of the building. So I'm back to where is the height actually going to be measured from? The height uh, calculation is determined based on definition of the land use bylaw. And to summarize, the land use bylaw sets out that how you measure height in the MD of Bighorn is you measure from finished grade where the dirt meets the building to roof peak. And then there are things that are exempt from height, like chimneys and uh, some mechanical equipment. But the finished grade to roof peak is how you measure height. So that last sentence then doesn't sound like it says the same thing. Um, sure, let me just have a quick look at that. Okay. Uh, I had the same question, Lynn. And uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, what Jan just described is the measurements from the final grades. So it's uh, going to be really important that we understand the grading plan. Yep. Right, so Lynn, the, the last sentence reads, any regrading and filling shall not affect the nine meter maximum height requirement for the dwelling. So I interpret that to mean that if they do any grading and filling, it should be the same meterage as it is now before they did it. Um, That's how I interpret that sentence. Yeah. I yeah. Go ahead, Jan. Oh, I was just going to say, yes, if they're going to be adjusting or regrading or, you know, filling, it, it, it has to, they have to measure appropriately. So uh, I just wanted to add quickly here, at walkouts, um, that's where usually height is exceeded, is at the walkout. And, and this is sort of like a walkout, the house is on a slope, um, it's got a, a front entry into the slope area. Um, so... On any side of the building, you measure from where the dirt meets the building. So in this case, it looks like the dirt's going to meet the building underneath the raised second deck. So on that side, they have to measure from where the dirt meets the building to roof peak. So okay, I'm not so sure if that's the, clear. Yeah, the clarification is the way this sentence reads, um, it kind of indicates that um, that they can't take into account the final grading. Whereas, you know, you're saying, and I think we believe that once that the measurement of the height of the building is based on the final grading of the site. Right? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. So, so I think we're going to suggest that maybe we reword, reword this last sentence. Sure. Yeah. Cause to me, it, it, the way it's worded now, it is confusing. Yeah. And, okay. and, Sure. Could I could I suggest that we use the wording from the from the bylaw? Uh, yes. Um, you mean from the definition of height, or yeah. it, do you have yeah. a section? No, okay. I haven't looked at sorry, but for yeah, we're, what it says about where the the height is measured from. Which yes, is, we could. We're, yeah, please. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I can use the wording from the definition of height and, and add that in the last sentence here. Right. Um, now, would you like me to just read that out loud to you or share my screen and show you what it says now? 
I think if you could read it, that'd be fine. Okay, if you just give me a second here, I'm just going to go to the definition and then I'll show I'll share my screen. I'm almost there, sorry. Uh, grade is also defined, by the way. Um, okay, so I'm going to, uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Let me just see which one is, which screen is going to come up here. Can you see it? Not yet. Not yet? Okay, just one nope. second. Oh, yes, you do, maybe? No? Okay, nope. I'm going to bring I'm going to bring it over to my other screen. I have two screens going here. Can you see it now? Nope. What? Maybe you could just read it out, Jeff. All right. Uh, my apologies. I thought it was sharing my screen. Let me just. Leslie might have to let you share the screen. Yeah, I should be able to do it no. from here. What kind of document is it, Ken? Sorry. It's the um, land use bylaw. So anyway, I've pressed the up arrow to share the screen, but it doesn't seem to like it today. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll read it to you. Um, so building height. Building height means the maximum vertical distance as measured from the elevation of the finished ground level at the base of each exterior wall to the highest point of the building on that particular side. And there's a figure seven, which shows it, unless otherwise stated in the district regulations. The calculation of building height excludes a roof, stairway entrance, and elevator housing, heating or ventilation equipment, flush mounted solar, skylights, steeples, chimneys, flagpoles, parapet walls, guardrails, things like that. Um, basically things that are not structurally essential to the building and that are less than a meter in height. So in short, um, just summarizing the definition, height is measured from where the dirt meets the building, the finished grade to roof peak on any side of the building. Okay, so I, I wanna suggest that we just delete that whole last sentence of three. Okay. Uh, because everything <clears throat> we've referred to, um, the land use bylaw and uh, and the requirement to meet the what's prescribed in the land use bylaw in the first sentence of that condition. Um, and if we delete the last one, that'll take away any confusion. Um, does anyone think that we need to do any more explanation of that? No, I'm good with, with that, Terry. Good with that? Okay. Anything else, Lynn? Uh, I did have one other question on recommendation 20. So we don't have the final site grading plan for the drainage. Is that my understanding? But we're kind of saying there that it has to be complete. I'm just not sure what that condition is really highlighting. Hi, sorry. Uh, yes, condition 11. Uh, 20. 20. Okay, um, so condition 20 reads that the owner is responsible to ensure that site grading is completed to uh, provide effect effective site drainage and that no site will be uh, site drainage will be allowed to drain onto neighboring properties and the development shall not cause adverse drainage impact on adjacent properties or flooding of ditches um, in excess of their capabilities. So my question is, is there not a drainage plan that you guys require that should be approved? No, um, there isn't a requirement for a drainage plan in this hamlet like you used to seeing uh, maybe in the new uh, development Rivers Bend in Dead Man's Flats. In that case, that was okay. a new subdivision. There was grading and drainage plans done by engineers and all of the buildings and lots in that subdivision must comply with that drainage plan. We don't have one for Harvey Heights or some of our older existing hamlets. 
So could we, we require one or by the bylaw we can't? Absolutely, you could. As MPC, yeah. this is a discretionary use. So if you would like to see that, you just ask for it and put it in the form of a condition and adopt okay. it. Thanks, Jan. That's my question. Okay. Uh, Josh. Hey, thanks. I, I just had a question and maybe I'm ahead of myself here. Somewhere I read that the deck is is oversized as well as encroaches on the front yard setback. And then one question, are they are they in this permit, are they asking for the stairwell or the stairway from the deck uh, to be approved as well? I'm just, is that part of this development? There's stairs coming off the deck on the left side elevation. Um, the only thing that I see is if that's the case, it looks like they've added a window or something on that same elevation where the stairwell or the staircase is. So is that is that staircase still in there and is that why it's oversized? The deck is oversized on width or well, I, I think I'll I'll defer that to Mr. Uh, Wallace. However, the the stair remember the dwelling's already been approved, um, including stairways and everything. This application is to reflect some changes. So right. my 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 understanding of what the issue here is with the rear decks is that they were built um, in further into the setback, and they're just bigger than what they were originally proposed to be. Okay, so they're not wider, they're just further towards the front yard. I I believe so, but Mr. Wallace is here today. He could probably explain that better than myself. Okay, we'll, we'll come to that in a sec. Um, just further to that question, Jan, was the upper deck on the original approval? I can't remember. Yes? Yes, it was. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, any other questions for Jan? I just so one, one, we, one more. Oh, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Just the, so this um, on page 190, that's this is the proposed, uh, just so I'm getting this right. On page 190 is, is the elevations. Are they different from the first set of plans you guys reviewed in the first meeting that didn't have this cantilever? Yeah, they are. They, so, yes. So we're, so, we're reviewing different plans that then were approved. I'm just kind of wondering how that works. So what you're looking at are revised elevation drawings from what was originally approved. Okay. And so they're asking for that to also be approved or? Yes, they are. And now just, I don't have a, I don't have a full set of plans here. So I'm just going off elevations. Now in the original plan with the cantilever, is the cantilever to achieve, this will be a question, I guess, to, to Mr. Wallace, is it, is the cantilever to achieve a bigger lower deck or was the, or have they made it bigger on the top floor? Or do you know that? Yet? I think it was bigger on the top floor, but I'm going to have to defer that to You want me to Wallace. answer that now or wait till? If, if you don't mind, uh, Chris, just, just one second, we'll come back to you. Okay, sure. Um, so I think at this point we should uh, we should get into the uh, speak to the applicants. But before we do that, John, I just want to um, uh, confirm we've deleted condition 12 and we've deleted the last sentence of condition three. You're, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, I have that the last sentence of number three has been struck. Yeah. Um, and the and staff recommendation number 12 has been removed. Right. That's what I, I have here. Yep. Okay. Is good. that Thanks. right? Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Just want to make sure we've got that. Yes. And Mr. Chairman, just quickly clar clarification. So you didn't want me to replace that last sentence with uh, a definite with some wording out of the definition of height? I'm I not sure if I'm thought, clear on that. Sorry. No, we thought not. Um, we made a reference in the first sentence of that condition to the to the requirements uh, in the LUB, which is everything that you read, read out loud. 
right? And I think I think our understanding is is good now. We're all on the same page that the that the height will be measured from the final grades, and uh, so we can go with that. Uh, sorry, before we come to you, Chris, uh, Kevin, you've got something. Yes, I think we have a duplication in condition 31 and 34. It looks like, yep. Yeah. Sorry, I was muted. Yes. Um, sorry. Um, yep. The, another duplication. So you could remove either 31 or 34, um, your choice. They both say basically the same thing. Yeah, they do. So let's let's remove 34. Okay. Okay, that's all at this moment. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, Chris, if you'd like to uh, make some comments, I think we have a couple outstanding questions. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll address those if, if, as you go. Sure. Okay, yeah, just um, in regards to those two questions that you had earlier, the, the width of the deck, yeah, Jan is correct. It's not the width across the back of the house. It's kind of the depth closest to the power lines is, is what we're talking about there. So the stairs and everything that was approved previously. So it is... That is just talking about the width of the deck from when you walk out of the house to the end of the deck. That's the encroachment they're talking about. Um, the cantilever question, the the reason for the cantilever on the house, which was added uh, after the original development permit was uh, approved, was just to gain extra square footage in the home. That's what that was about. Um, so it had nothing to do with the deck. That's one of the reasons why we've got the issue with the deck projecting into the rear side yard is the deck got built the same size as original, uh, originally was approved, but the house uh, cantilever had grown another two feet. So that's one of the things that contributed to it there. Uh, uh, Chris, yeah. Chris, that uh, and... Was there not also uh, the location of the house is further towards the power line than originally planned? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I've got those three three things kind of listed uh, starting on page 181 of the uh, kind of on my cover letter, just summarizing uh, kind of why we're in the situation we're in right now. Um, yeah, so, I, um, oh, go ahead. Sorry, if I could uh, relate uh, to the uh, to Paul's earlier question about building permits, these changes in the house, um, changes of the location on the property, um, like the cantilever, adding the lower deck instead of the uh, patio deck, were those all um, added or was the building permit revised uh, to reflect those? Uh, the building permit was not revised for the lower uh, the lower deck uh, or the cantilever actually, but neither one of those was revised on the building permit. Um, as of this point, as far as inspections from the building inspector, we've had an inspection on the foundation, um, and we have not called for a framing inspection yet, as uh, we kind of stopped construction just right about the time that we would call for that. So um, as far as the uh, building inspector goes, uh, there won't be any issue with the actual building or the construction of the building. I'm, I'm sure of that. The building inspector doesn't uh, really enforce to any degree setbacks or anything like that. They don't come out and physically measure how far you are from property lines unless it's an obvious uh, side yard setback. 
you know, in town, if you're supposed to be five feet from the property line and it's obvious that you're four or three, then the building inspector might have a concern, but they generally don't check setbacks. If there's any issues with setbacks or anything like that, that usually kind of gets flushed out uh, when we get the real property report near the end of construction. We've had uh, we've had occasions in the past where where, where it does start to impact um, with uh, the building permit and building code is when buildings get too close to each other. Yes. Um, and and in this case, of course, the the direction that you've moved the building um, is is towards vacant space. So I wouldn't expect that the building um, inspector would would have any issue. Um, Paul, just before we go on, Chris, Paul, does that satisfy your question about building permit? You're you're muted, Paul. Paul, Paul, you're you're muted. Yeah. Uh, no, I have another question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I the uh, the original building was. Uh, under the original development permit uh, had a set of plans uh, that uh, that the uh, contractor would build by. I'm assuming that uh, that um, somehow those plans got changed and uh, now uh, with an extension of I think you, you mentioned two feet in the uh, uh, in the house, uh, so um, <clears throat> so. In my opinion, the building inspector uh, uh, should have brought that up somehow. Yes, the building probably. Um, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I'd have to check and see uh, if we did submit for the building uh, permit the plans with the cantilever. We may or may not have. It, I'd, I'd have to go back and check and see which one was approved there. Now, uh, the building inspector, when they come and do their inspection, they look at the floor trusses and the roof trusses and the floor truss diagram, which we provide them if it was different than the original, they would bring that up at that point, but then they would just confirm that it complies with the uh, with the floor truss layout. Does that answer your question? Well, it, yes and no. It uh, seems to be uh, a bit of a missing that that uh, that the change was made without uh, uh, really approval from the MD. So, so Paul, if I can interpret um, the. Uh, the contractors is uh, confident that the changes they're making, whether they had applied for them up to date now or or not, are going to meet building code. And uh, I, all that stuff is outside of our jurisdiction. So our requirement is only that they have that they get a building permit. And if uh, in in over the course of time that uh, that the the building the changes in the building. Uh, require changes in the building permit. That's between them and the and the issuer of the building permit. Uh, but the changes in the building still have to, from our perspective, still have to fit within the uh, setbacks um, and meet the intent of the original development permit. So um, I think the answer that we got um, regarding what what's happening with the building permit. Um, it is good for information, but uh, we have no control of that. Josh. Yeah, so I think what I'm what I'm struggling with is that we've got a set of plans in front of us that aren't current to what the building is like. Just looking at the building, there's an added window on the side also. So I think for me, it's do I believe that they're actually going to comply with the this new development permit when they're not even submitting accurate plans for what they're asking for and and, and it's kind of hard you know they've changed they've bumped the building out which obstructs the neighbor's view they've added a side yard window which 
also, you know, is obtrusive to the neighbor. Um, and, and, you know, is that, is that window even permanent? I know that's not building, that's not our department, but building code, you know, you're only allowed a certain amount of um, unprotected glass on the sides. I, I'm, my concern is that we're getting, a, we're going to be back here again and that they're not going to comply like they didn't the first time around. So I think that's maybe what Paul's getting at is that, yeah, it, the building permit isn't, isn't our department, but us being given accurate plans and the fact that they're going to follow through with what we ask and then we're not back here again once everything is done. Does that make sense? Okay, thanks, Josh. Chris, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I'm not seeing the extra window that you're talking about there on the plans. You refer to the one under the cantilever? Uh, Josh, you're muted if you're trying to tell us something. Sorry about that. Is it the one beside the window? I'm trying to... On, just off the deck. It'll, the top stairs that come down off the top deck, uh, they appear like they'll go right through the middle of it. Is that? I just have a picture from one of the submissions from the neighbors or from the community association. I'm just wondering how that deck works. And maybe that's not in that cantilever. It's hard to tell. You see what I'm? You see where the stairs come down? It appears that on a picture I see on page nine of that submission that there's potentially that it'll go right through the middle of the stairs. Is that is that window on the plan or is that not on the plan? That's a tall, narrow window you're talking about? Yeah, right by the post. Yeah, right by the post, yeah. So so that's that's shown is that on the, the window uh, on the left side elevation. Is that the house doesn't step in anywhere on that deck? I don't believe so, but we'll let Chris answer nope. that. Okay, yeah, no, sorry, I'm 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 out to lunch on that one. So I see Chris, it now. It's the deck the deck doesn't look the same, that's all. Yeah. Chris Joss is talking about those tall, narrow windows. There's one on each side uh, of yeah. the building, right at the edge yeah. of the deck. There. Yeah. Were those on the original plans? Uh, I believe they were, yeah. Because we don't have those in front of us. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you're correct. There is a certain percentage of glass that is a maximum for side yards there. Yeah. And that certain percentage of glass is only if the property is is within eight feet of the property, the next door neighbor's property or 2.4 yeah. meters or whatever. So so either way, we would be okay, even if it okay. did exceed that, but. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Chris, before you go on, Jan, you were, had your hand up? Yes, I just wanted to jump in and let you know that if if at any time you need you as MPC members need to see what the original approved drawings looked like within your agenda package at the end, I included original development permit 07 slash 21 and there's schedules attached to show some drawings in there um, just in case and and it only came to mind because you guys were talking about windows and what was on original drawings and what's on these so if you refer to the original development permit there are some schedules there that show what it originally looked like in your original approval i can also share my screen <laughs> if it works <laughs> um, <laughs> bringing up the original approved drawings for you should you wish yeah i see them there now sorry that that was my mistake i, I knew that that print was there but i hadn't uh, looked at those drawings thank, thank you jane terry can i just interject for a second 
Somebody mentioned uh, that, the original drawings for the window on the sides were actually supposed to be on the first level instead of the second level. So there is a difference in the drawing. Because of the change in the deck, it's now on the second instead of where it would have been at ground level, I think. I think just because that second deck is drawn on the drawing that you have in front of you on this application, like the lower deck where we were going to put the concrete patio, I think that's what's causing the confusion with that window. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The window I, I, was there on the original application. Yeah. It just kind of looked I, different. I see it now. It's just now that it's raised, yeah. Okay. I apologize for that. Oh, no problem. Mr. Chair, right. I just wanted to point out to you that Mr. Steiner has uh, commented in the comment section. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, you've got uh, a question? Mm -hmm. Yes, I've got a couple more questions. Uh, Chris, it was you who communicated with the MD on the original permit? Yes. Yes. And I'm just glancing at that original permit, and in the first condition, it says the submitted drawing shall be followed. And in the second condition, it says the single detached dwelling shall be located as shown. And Jan Thompson took the extra measure of writing in on the site plan the five point, I uh, forget the exact distance. Uh, But she wrote in the allowed distance from the power lines as well to clarify things. And then I look at your information that you provided us in this new application on page 181. And the first thing you mentioned is that the decision on the cantilever was made after you received the development permit. And you were commenting on that earlier and said that caused an increase in length of roughly two feet. So to me, that was a change in the submitted drawings and uh, a change in shall be located as shown. And then number two, your foundation contractor made another change, which according to condition one and Condition two had to be communicated to the MD. And then in number three, we see a third change, which moved everything to nearer the power lines. And all three of them are major changes, and all three of them immediately violate condition one and condition two in your development permit. So I guess my question is, who was on site and who was in charge? That well, I'll, oh, can you hear me there? Yes, yes I can. Thanks. Okay. Uh, ultimately, I'm in charge. That's that falls on me completely. There, um, the cantilever. Uh, we we should have. I should have picked up on that. We were chatting with the homeowner for quite a period of time about whether to put this cantilever on or not. Once we got the development permit, there was a fair bit of time before we actually were starting construction. And at some point during that time, we decided to put the cantilever on. And I should have brought that up with the MD and I didn't. There's, uh, yeah, there's just, it's just that simple. Um, the the second point with the foundation contractor, that uh, wasn't really a change. It was a mistake on the foundation contractor. Um, he just kind of took some initiative on his own that he shouldn't have once he saw the cantilever. Um, you're you're speaking yeah, the, about, sorry, Chris, sorry. you're speaking about the position of the piles? Yes. Okay, yes. Thanks. Yeah. And then uh, the the third point with the longer uh, 
driveway again that was just an error on our part uh, the reason why i uh, uh, one of the reasons why we've got this letter and i laid those out right away is just to explain what happened there it's not it was nothing malicious we weren't trying to sneak anything by anybody it was uh just a combination of some errors that ended up pushing the house back a lot further than than what we should have. Yes, I'm willing to accept the combination of errors, but that combination has put us in a very awkward position at this time because it appears as if half of the community is up in arms because the neighbors who who looked at the original plans and said they had no objections uh, did not get at all what they thought they were okay, and uh, it just seems to nullify the whole process we went through. If you would follow the permit and and notify the MD of those changes as the permit required, we wouldn't be in this mess we're in this morning. And I don't see any easy way of well overcoming it. Yes, we can grant you the new the new variances, but does that mean the next person that builds a house gets a permit, does what they feel like doing, intentionally or unintentionally, and I'm willing to accept yours was unintentional, uh, and then come back and say, oops, I made a mistake, uh, I need a bigger variance. Uh, yeah, I just have big problems with that procedure, and I'm trying to figure out some way to to remedy this situation. And I guess I'm connecting it at this point with the geotechnical report. Uh, I don't recall any mention of changing the grade in that report or adding a whole bunch of extra fill in the front yard near the power line. And I'm wondering if we need to require a whole new geotechnical report. Uh, okay, looking at the whole front slope from the point of view of all the added backfill and from what you're saying there's going to be a whole bunch more to backfill it to squeak in under the height restriction uh yeah i don't know if that's going to be safe or not because the new comments from the geotechnical and the engineer uh didn't seem to mention a major quantity of backfill that's already there and then more being added in, in the future. So we might be okaying something that isn't, that isn't being built on a slope that's safe. So that's the predicament I see our committee being stuck with at the moment. So and if I could jump, sorry Kevin, if I could jump in there, I have the same concern. And uh, if I could ask, we, I've made a note of that, if we can come back to that um uh in a later in the discussion okay um is was there anything else that you wanted to add there right now uh just one sec i wanna yeah and of course with all the backfill added uh i think we need a detailed uh landscaping plan or whatever the correct term is before we allow you to proceed because uh because once the project is finished and the and the water flow was on the neighboring projects, and that's kind of late to address it. So, so I'm thinking we may need a detailed plan at this moment, and then somebody keeping an eye on it and make sure the plan is followed, is my line of thinking. I really hate having to come up with these kind of suggestions, but uh, I thought the original permit was very clear on what you could and couldn't do. And I'm just not seeing that being followed. But Terry, if we want to come back to this later, I'm fine with that. Yes, please. I think so. Like there's going to be more. There will be more uh, uh, items for us to discuss. Um, so I've got quite a few people asking to speak. Jan, uh, you've been waiting longest, I think. <coughs> Hi. Um, sorry, I just forgot to take my hand down. Okay. Um, so, from the last time, my apologies. Okay, thank you. And Josh, you had your hand up. Uh, you okay? 
Yeah, I think uh, Mr. Hebb's definitely, I'm on the same page as him. He's yeah. he's said everything I was going to say. Okay, thanks. Uh, oh, Lynn, sorry. Uh, just one quick thing to ask of Chris. So I would like an explanation of why the grade was actually changed. I don't think we've gotten that. Why, why did the grade go up so much? And if I could add to that, uh, there was mentioned earlier, Jan mentioned that the uh, building is higher out of the ground. I'm not sure that that's the case. Can you comment uh, on the elevation of the ground floor? Is it the same as what it was originally planned? Yeah, the comment where the the house is, is higher out of the ground isn't really correct there or, or worded quite right on the original drawing the lower floor was two feet lower than the elevation drawings that you have in front of you now uh, at that level because the inside the house it was going to drop down two feet so they had a little higher uh, living space ceiling uh, we raised that up when we did the foundation so that that two feet was gone so they'd have more room in the crawl space so that makes the height look worse than it is um, the original plan with the floor being two feet lower uh, did comply with the nine meter height restrictions so the photographs, <laughs> the drawing and stuff that you have there now, uh, the 29 or the nine meter mark is a fair bit below the the existing deck, which uh, I've kind of shown in some of the pictures there as well. So to make sure we understand, when you uh, eliminated that um, dropped floor, lowered floor, when you yes. raised that floor up to make the make the uh, crawl space taller, yes. did that also did that result in the roof line going up? No, so no, was, it was the roof yeah. line. the The building height stayed the same. Yeah, uh, it's just we raised the floor on the lower level. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Okay. Um, then I think the other factor on the building looking higher is the fact that it's further down the slope. Yeah. So, right, as, as you go further down the slope, then, uh, then the ground drops away, and so that's what's required, all this extra fill that's being proposed. Yes. Okay, so is everybody, looks like everybody's okay. Chris, do you want to carry on with, uh, is there anything else you wanted to say? Um. not a lot really like i tried to lay everything out in that cover letter um explaining what happened and what we're proposing to do and that type of thing <coughs> a lot of questions come up as we go through all this here that i can answer but um yeah i think if you've read the cover letter that that um, i'm good with that all right, thank you. Um, before we get into uh, remedies and decisions, we need to hear from from the uh, members of the public who want to address the commission. Um, but I'll just ask before we do that, does anybody want to take a break? Or shall we carry on? Paul? Yeah, I'll take a break. and I'll be back in about two minutes. Um, well, we... Sorry, I can't remember, Jan, do we need to uh, have a motion for a break? Or do we just? I would like to make a motion that yes. we, we convene in nine minutes at 11 o'clock. Yeah, okay. Motion needed, yeah. Okay, so we have a motion to, take to uh, what's it called? We're gonna stop anyway. Recess. Recess, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> motion to yeah, recess. recess until 11 o'clock, which is so 11 minutes. o'clock. So uh, Paul Clark, you in favor? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Joss? Yes. I'm in favor, so that motion is carried. We'll come back at 11 o'clock.
waiting in the back or the front yard. Uh, I don't think I mentioned it in my cover letter, but I think I sent some emails into the MD and stuff before about uh, the homeowner's intention was to put in retaining walls and tear the yard after the house was done, kind of on their own uh, their own volition there, just to do it to get the yard so they had a little more usable space because it is a slopey yard to begin with. Um, and we were under the understanding that retaining walls up to three feet, you don't need a permit for. And I believe that's the case, but I'm not 100% sure. So when we had to come to MPC again, that is why we applied for the four foot retaining wall there, as opposed to just the homeowner doing some Allen block or terracing or whatever on their own accord when the house was complete. So yeah, I think that's, I just wanted to kind of throw that in there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think we saw some of that in the, in the presentation. Um, Leslie, sorry, you had your hand up. Um, did you have something? I, I do. Uh, we just, we need to uh, make sure that we move into open session before we start rediscussing things. So you have to um, ensure that Lana and I are back on, on mainstream for the viewing public. Thank you. All right, thanks. I was uh, anxious because I was late and we jumped back in there without checking. Uh, okay, so um, at this point we'll go ahead with uh, with the other um, people who would like to speak. Uh, just a reminder that uh, you'll have five minutes uh, and please address the chair. And I'm just going to go through the list as I have it. Um, and I think we still don't have Mr. Steiner, so Bob uh, Nobrega, would you like to go ahead? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to expand on the concerns raised in our written submission regarding DP application 7321 and amendments to DP 0721. Uh, to say that we're disappointed that the staff recommendation is to allow the permit would be an understatement. That's both because of the substantial variances to the original plan and what was communicated to the homeowners and then the flagrant disregard in terms of the changes that are made subsequent to that. As another aside, the only way the walk, this could be possibly a walkout is if you don't mind a nine foot drop off the back deck. With regards to the intentions of the contractor, I'll also note that through the process, a neighbor very familiar with um, planning and blueprints consistently informed them that there was errors in terms of what was being um, actually done on site. You'll have gathered from our written submission that neither my wife nor I are civil engineers, but whether there is or isn't a height variance associated with the structure of 405 Bow River shouldn't require some nuanced knowledge of the term finished grade level. A reasonable expectation would be that if there was going to be significant difference between natural grade or existing grade and the finished grade anywhere on the property, it would be properly disclosed in the pre-construction permit process with the MD and in communications to the affected neighbors. And such a requirement is included in section 42.4 of the general development permit application requirements where the site plan must show site topography grades and drainage before construction. The contractor's submission indicates that the mounding of 68 feet of soil or aggregate on the front exterior wall is a new requirement in response to building errors and overt decisions that are contrary to the original permit. His proposals contorts the common understanding of the term finished grade that is shown in the diagrams employed by many Alberta municipalities including Bighorn in figure seven, building height, land use bylaw number nine, 718. 
since it wasn't an original feature of the site plan and doesn't conform to the diagrams used to illustrate final grade level in civil engineering or municipal documents, it must be a cynical attempt to foil MD bylaws and specific directions as pointed out by Mr. Kreb regarding building height. It challenges the purpose of regulated height restrictions and erodes confidence in bylaws and their application. You'll note at the, the end of the submission from the contractor that there's a drawing with a, a red line that shows where the soil has to be piled up against the side of the house. Well, again, height of 68 feet, just so that the measurement will fit within the municipal bylaws. The contractor has indicated his submission that significant dirt work, his words, would be required for survey to show the home in compliance with the original permit. Let's call it for what it is, an unapproved height variance. Further, he discloses that even more regrading the property was planned by the homeowner, but not disclosed in either the original permit process or in the initial communications with neighbors. The application for a development permit for a 1.2 meter retaining wall and the associated 42 inch railing represents a further abuse of the development approval process and the neighbor enjoyment derived from their properties and econ economic value of those properties. The committee has the right, if not the obligation to refuse the permit on the basis of 3.9.1, 3.9.5, and 3.11.3 of the land use bylaw number 9718. Though a different jurisdiction, Canmore's engineering design and construction guidelines from March of 2020, section 3.2.1, provides what seems like prudent direction that grading for all lots is to be kept to a minimum. Building types shall be chosen and built in a way that accommodate the pre development landscape as much as reasonably possible. Alterations to the natural topography should be minimized as per the town's guidelines for subdivision and development in the mountainous terrain. Again, the MD doesn't use explicit direction like this to my knowledge, but coming <coughs> from a close neighboring community with similar geotechnical and hydrological issues, it seems like good guidance in this case and can be enforced with the existing MD rules. In the interest of time, I won't delve too deeply into the setback variance request but it is equally egregious given the originally unopposed approval, the tiny margin the contractor decided to leave in the original location of the home, the specific direction the permit provided regarding not encroaching on the 6.5 meters, and the casual decisions and building practices that led to the variance request. The variance request itself is highly opportunistic in noting the errors as the cause and then not providing any rationale for further relief. I hope the planning committee agrees that there is undisclosed height variance and that the remedy in the new permit application involving significant changes to the grading of the property are at odds with the original permit, the interest of neighbors, the community of Harvey Heights and the MD. A work order to have the construction at 405 Bow River Drive conform to the original permit and plan is an imperative and there should be no further approvals of variances or permits considered until the work order has been satisfied at a minimum. Further, in the event that reconfiguration of the site's contours were to be considered post remediation of the existing errors, something more than a historical geotechnical and hydrological analysis should be required at a minimum. If we are to learn anything from the recent events in British Columbia, even the best engineered projects are being impacted by severe weather events. Surface hydrological flows need to be addressed on a community basis and not on opportunistically or, or cynically with significant adjustments to any aspect of the original EGL. If there are to be changes to the EGL, they should be identified in the pre-construction development approval process as specified by the bylaws, not on some post or mid-construction remedy for errors and overt decisions contrary to the permit. Thank you for your time and attention. Thanks, Bob. Uh, any questions for Bob before we go? Then let's move on to uh, Mr. Wells. Oh, there you are. 
I think you're uh, muted, Joseph. Too many, too many knobs to push. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, MPC, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, other attendees. Um, I just, first of all, I want to note that we were not informed that this was a new development permit being applied for, but they were amendments, uh, which I suggested to the uh, planning group should be variances versus amendments uh, when I first contacted them, but we weren't informed. And I think that that would have been a process whereby this was mailed out by all the information would have been mailed out by the MD um, as per the first package. Um, just as a way of background, um, I'm representing myself and my wife on 401 Bow River Drive, adjacent, immediately adjacent. We've lived here since 96, my wife since 65. I'm, I've been the owner of um, uh, engineering firms, hydro geotechnical, uh, civil engineering, environmental and planning uh, firms for 35 years. I've been involved in many projects. Uh, one of note was the one mentioned by Paul Ryan in the, M the MPC meeting of March 17th, 2021, uh, where he notes that there have been uh, lawsuits regarding slope failures. Uh, we were one of the geotechnical firms on file at that time. Um, the, so we did not receive the development permit package. I, I was told that if that was the case, um, and we received much mail from the MD all of our lives, uh, if that was the case, that must have been the fault of the post office. However, we were not informed of it. Um, however, I was, I did look at the plans by, from someone else. And at that point, we did not object. And I'm referring in some senses to my, my submission to you. I'll go through that as I go along. This is just an introduction. Um, during this period, though, I'd like to say that I had several conversations uh, with the owners and with the developers as these things were going along, and I tried to not insert myself in the process, but just offer um, my comments to certain issues, and that'll come out. Um, and those things stem from my fact of I had comments and conversations with the original owner, uh, the um, Elwood Thompson, who I was the father of the present owner now, uh, regarding the whole issue of water flow across the uh, landscape um, and things that we would need to do uh, probably as, as landowners, since the MD does not take care of that particular issue within the Hamlet of Hardy Heights. But I'd like to say that um, in my first, the, and I'll just go through now my, my, um, uh, my application to you just to bring up some of the issues but I'd like to say the, and I'm on page, I put in some of the issues there, but I'm on page now, page six, where it shows the original plan. Um, there were on the original plan, no grading indications uh, at all. If the original plan was to change the location, change the location grade, then these should have been a, a normal cut and grade uh, program uh, that would have been done. It's a, uh, you know, I, I would say that I, I put in some comments. You can read those comments. I, I don't want to offer my my opinions or comments as a professional, but I have been involved in many, many more projects of very, very large intent where geotechnical and slope stabilities were very significantly done. Um, and there were always opinions and differences of opinions between geotechnical engineers even, but I'll come to that in a moment. Um, with, when it comes to the changes, when the, in the first comments that Mr. Uh, uh, or the Mr. Uh, Chris Wallace had uh, uh, done in the first one, the change plans or plans after issue, um, they've obviously not met the two the two pieces of the 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 thing as I noted, but they're making changes on the fly, and I was standing what standing right on my deck, having coffee, oftentimes while the gen set was running. Um, at more than 80 decibels watching this happening. So, and so that's just the case. And now we, we would say that, you know, and, and the other thing is I was there when they staked the lot and the stake where they placed the lot uh, house on the lot, one meter ahead into the front yard was done by the surveyor, absolutely. And then the blame was put on the foundation contractor. I was there when the foundation contractor was there. I said, um, I think the pillars on your, 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 uh, your deck are too far out by quite a ways towards the front yard. And he went, no, that's what's on the plans. I'm doing it correctly. And then the blame was placed on a professional surveyor um, 
for saying, oh, yes, that conforms, or yes, you can move the house. No professional surveyor that I know of, because they're under a 99-year legal obligation to not do things which don't conform to the numbers, would say to a, a builder or an owner, oh, yes, you can move that forward. They, they, they wouldn't do that. They're under instructions from the builder. So they, they would have done that under instructions from the builder, not from anyone else. And they would not, and, and, and I would wonder if they'd been informed that they were told that they were their name was being used in this context to move a house forward and thus uh, use their name to change a building permit. Um, so the over height issue, and now I'm on page nine, uh, the application for height variance is the ability to adhere without significant effects. I think you can kind of see that there's a significant effect when you look at this compared to the original drawings that we were provided um, to give us the intention what was being built. And even the owner told us we were just building a small place. And I believe you'll see further on in the NPC meeting, uh, the uh, uh, the builder, um, Mr. Wallace, said to the NPC, and on, don't worry, we're just putting it in the exact same location as the original cabin. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, I think in the second, the second picture on page um, number nine, you'll see the grade line as I interpret it. Now, I may be a little bit off, but I believe the grade line is under immediately underneath the present second deck uh, up from what is now a third floor patio. Um, and so that's that's over over height for sure, at least 2.3 meters. Um, of course, I didn't do it with the transit, so and I'm not a, a property, I'm not uh, purporting to be a, a survey engineer. In B2 on page 10, the front yard Excuse setback variance is... Excuse yes. me, sorry, sorry about in, but you're five minutes up. Can I get you to wrap up, please? Yes, uh, I would like to say that the front yard variance, and this is a letter from a, my from a purchaser, a possible purchaser, has included, and you will have that in your package, significant financial effect. And my suggestion is we revert back to the original development permit and and not allow this to happen, and that they go back to the original approval. And uh, that may you'll get more out of my package in that sense. That's I could I could spend three hours on this as a teaching course in geotechnical engineering if I wanted. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on then. Um, I don't believe that uh, Jason Leobanto is here. So let's go to Mr. Hepburn, representing the uh, Community Association. Good morning, uh, respected uh, chairman and uh, councillors, members of the uh, MPC uh, development officer and uh, MD staff. Thank you for taking uh, the time to hear uh, the concerns of the Hervey Heights Community Association. As president, uh, I'm making this presentation on, on the behalf of the, the membership. Uh, the majority of the residents are currently members of the HHCA, so there is a strong mandate to uh, uh, make representation here. Uh, regarding DP 0721, uh, I'd just like to, to skip over a lot of the, the presentation that the 12 page presentation that, that you should have in your package. I'd like to note that conditions of the, the, the d development permit conditions 1, 2, 3, 5, 26, schedules B, schedule C, condition 10 and 12 were not observed. So uh, that is there are a lot of excuses uh, presented, but if there are so many errors, does this not amount to negligence? Uh, so we're just kind of curious as to how this uh, this came about. Um, so there were unapproved changes uh, without prior consent or approval from the MD. Uh, the as-built location of the building, addition of a lower deck, and the uh, infringement upon the uh, 6.5 meter setback, which had been varied from the 7.5 meters. Increased structure height from two stories to three uh, above that uh, requiring a variance. And uh, incidentally, I guess, uh, change of the septic system location. Uh, the uh, septic permit was supposed to be uh, received by the MD on, uh, I believe it was April 30th, 2021. It still has not received the septic system permit. There's been changes in the location. Um, the old location just uh, 
while I'm on this topic, uh, was in the front yard on the, if you're looking down slope on the left-hand side, there is a diagram on page 10 of my presentation. The orange area outlined was the original septic field location. Um, to represent that uh, the landowner was proposing to uh, put piers and landscaping on the project <clears throat> really flies in the face of uh, construction practices, approved construction practices for septic fields. So that doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't wash. I'd also like to point out that uh, historically, uh, all the building permits that I'm familiar with in Herdy Heights did uh, what was under the standing that the finished uh, or that any height variance was based upon the pre-construction grade. I myself built under this uh, uh, practice and I have reports from uh, numerous other landowners that have had similar experiences that it's the pre-construction elevation that determines the height variance. And in fact, in the LUB 2358A for the commercial zone, it does say that building heights are considered from pre-development grade. So there may be some uh, uh, bylaw revisions that we may have to address at some point, but uh, uh, if we require further clarity. On page two, uh, you can see the pre-construction um, plan elevation, the front elevation presented, and then directly below it is the uh, photograph showing <laughs> the as-built structure. And there's a whole uh, apparent floor that is uh, missing from the permits. There's also four feet of fill added to uh, support that lower deck that was not on the original uh, building plan. Um, scooting right along uh, over to uh, well, conditions two and five uh, were clearly ignored. Um, there have to be, and, and there was great attention paid to care must be taken to ensure that the maximum height of the building is not exceeded and there are no encroach, encroachment in, into the setback area. So that was completely flagrant, flagrantly uh, disregarded. Um, so several landowners on Bull River Drive have, have inquired if this is a new standard for construction and permits and that following the conditions and plans of, on a development permit are optional. Well, we're concerned about that. Page four uh, shows the as building setback, uh, 4.92 meters. It was supposed to be 6.5. Page five. Um, so Page five, okay. It shows the front elevation clearly on the plan and it says rear elevation, but that was just confusion on the part of the, uh, the builder, I guess, or the person that uh, designed it. So it clearly shows grade walkout onto a patio there, no deck, no uh, lower level exposed. And then the next page six, there's a photograph showing the uh, the entire structure that was not approved on uh, the development permit. Um, so there's also a potential site drainage onto the adjacent lot <laughs> with the fill, and there's considerably more fill to come potentially. Uh, page seven, um, you can see that the original DPA, the roof peak to ground level at the walkout was 29 feet three and three sixteenths inches. So. The, the photograph below that shows below the deck, and that is a considerable amount of height. It's much greater than two feet that may have changed as a result of uh, raising the, uh, the, the, uh, the sunken living room. However, um, that was not on the permit. Um, the, uh, the top, note that the top of elevation, uh, the top of the foundation is still uh, in excess of the nine meters, we're looking at approximately 2.33 meters uh, of uh, elevation for the structure. So kind of curious how all that uh, managed to uh, come about. Uh, hey. Mr. Mr. Hepburn, yes. if I can interrupt, your, your, your time is up. Can I ask you to wrap up, please? Yes, certainly. Okay. So will this example set the new standard for DPAs and construction practices? Will the MD avoid setting any new precedents by granting relaxations or variances after the fact? 
Uh, will the MD require that the conditions of DPO 721 be obeyed and that non-compliance requires removal of structure and complying with the conditions? What recourse will adjacent landowners have if it, uh, conditions 14 and 15 are not met, adverse draining? What liabilities does the MD have for any non-compliance to conditions that are varied after the fact? Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate uh, your time and attention. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, that the other two people I originally requested uh, to speak uh, are not here. Um, so that's everyone. Um, at this point, uh, I think we've got some questions of a legal nature. Um, and I would like to move that we move in camera to discuss those. Any discussion of that? So, uh, just excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, I see on my screen uh, Kelly, and uh, I'm not sure uh, whether he's uh, wanting to speak. I'm uh, sorry, yeah, Kelly, would you like to uh, say anything? Oh, you're muted there now. Okay, thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just like to bring one thing up between the property owner on 401 and ourselves. After that rain event that took place, I believe, in 2015, there was a makeshift retaining wall that was put in place right up along Bow River Drive. So now, since that event, any water that comes down Potter Street and the majority of the water that comes down above Mr. Wells' property is being completely redirected over onto 405. And if you look at the last RPR report and you go down that property line towards where he has a dory coming out of his uh, property, you'll see there are a couple makeshift retaining walls there also. Both of those retaining walls are directly on the property line. So all of that water that is coming off of that side of his property is coming over onto 405 Bow River Drive. So I'm really having trouble understanding what the issue is with above surface drainage. Thank you for your time. Well done. Great, thank you. Okay, so I have a motion on the table for uh, to move in camera. I'm sorry, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, interrupt you again. I just yep. saw a screen that uh, somebody else is waiting in the lobby. It was me. Ah, there's uh, Mr. Mr. Steiner. Steiner has joined us. <coughs> okay, so before we uh, before we vote on that, let's uh, hear from Mr. Steiner. Um, Mr. Steiner, have you been listening to what's gone on before this? Hi, how are you doing? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, sorry. I, I'm just asking if you've been listening to what's happened before this. Um, yes, I've been listening to most of it. Um, I just want to say the, um, the original, the, the two photographs where the um, where the, the new grade line is written in red misrepresent the existing um, conditions of the house and i'm also wondering um if the um if one of the problems that originally arose around this whole house arised from the original architectural drawings because they're drawn on a flat ground and that seems to have been the reason why they had to um do this got us into this mess in the first so, you know, like, once again, we're dealing with architectural drawings. I, I didn't have any trouble with those architectural drawings like a year and a half ago, but now we're dealing with um, misrepresentations of where this, like, mound is going to go. And I don't want to sit looking at a one meter mound for the next hundred years of my life.
Well, I, I just like okay. to worry so much about the misrepresentations of the of the Colbray um, homes and who actually did that original architect drawing. Could it was it Colbray Homes that did it? Because if it was, then this is an, another instance of them misrepresenting their intentions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a motion on the table to go in camera. I think it's, sorry, I think Chris has a uh, um, question or response. I'm sorry, Paul, I didn't catch that. So, Kelly, okay, sir. Kelly, yeah. Kelly, go ahead. Have I got my hand up? No, we don't. Uh, Kelly, you're you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, you can. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just like would like to highlight uh, an issue here. All of those properties that are along the front portion of Harvey Heights along Bow River Drive. All of those properties were built years ago, and it's beyond me when they were built, why on earth those people would build those structures. Some of them are three, four, four feet below the grade of, of the street level. I had the neighbor just tell me in a recent phone call that he has to put weeping tile in his basement because he has water in his basement. Now, none of these uh, issues have anything to do with what's taking place at 405 Bull River Drive. The whole issue is that all these properties are built so far below grade, and that's why they are so concerned about water runoff. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Kevin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chris Wallace has a hand up. Yeah, Kevin was first there, sorry. I'm um, sorry. Oh, okay, I, sorry, I didn't quite hear whose name you had given, and I thought maybe my hand was up by accident. Okay, maybe it was by accident, Kevin, sorry. Chris, go ahead. Uh, no, I think I'm, I'm good there. It's kind of okay. been flushed out there, yeah. You don't want All right, it. thanks. Anybody else? Paul. I'll make a motion to go into camera, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think there's a, I, I made a motion earlier on, it's already, it's uh, standing waiting oh, for okay. a vote. So, uh, okay. uh, so this motion <laughs> to go in camera, Paul Clark, do you agree? Yes. Kevin? I agree, but I saw Mr. Wallace have his hand up. I wonder if he wants to say any last thing before we go in camera. Um. I guess uh, just a couple things that have come up through through the other comments there. Uh, in regards to the septic location, uh, the on our original application, we were hoping to do a septic tank with a small field. Uh, as it turns out through the proctor tests and what have you, we can't put in a field. We have to just go with a septic tank with... Uh, that gets pumped out. So the tank has stayed in the same location as, as it always was. Uh, the only difference now is we won't have any kind of field uh, for the septic system. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, I think that's all I've got there, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bob uh, Nobriga, do you have uh, you wanted to say something? Yes, please. I think we just heard from the homeowner that the intention was to change uh, the grade on the property. He was just questioning why anyone would build below grade. And as you'll note, there is uh, no application in the original permit uh, to do so. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go back to the vote on the motion to uh, go on camera. We're going to start over again on the roll call. 
So this motion to go on camera, Paul Clark, do you, do you yes. approve? Yes. And Maybe. Kevin? Yes. Lynn? Yes. And Josh? Yes. And I approve. So uh, for all those listening, we're going to leave this meeting right now and go in camera. And we'll be back um, when we're finished uh, that discussion. So please just hang on.
Un moment. And you're live, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, so we're uh, we're back. Um, calling the meeting back to order. We don't need a uh, start, we don't need a motion to come out of camera, do we? No, you don't. No. Okay. Um. So, uh, this has been a very difficult um, application for us. We've uh, we've heard lots of um, lots of information from uh, both from the applicants and from uh, from the neighbors and the community, and uh, we've listened to that and uh, looked at uh, all of the the um, all of the information that's been put forward to us, and. Uh, we're trying to make we've tried to make the best decision that we can um, for the benefit of both the applicants and the community. Uh, so, can I have a motion for uh, for refusal? Uh, Lynn. So, I'm going to make a recommendation that we, or better, I'm going to suggest we don't accept the re recommendation from staff that we reject this application. And per a discussion we had, there are a number of reasons, and I think Jan wrote them down, if you wouldn't mind sharing them with us. Sure. Um, firstly, um, I did make a mistake, Terry. I'm very sorry. We do need a motion to come out of camera. Um, that's my mistake. I'm sorry. I should have I should have said yes, we do need a motion. So all I need all we need to do, Terry, is just go back quickly and get someone to yep. make a motion to come out of camera at twelve fifty seven. PM. I'll make I'll make okay. the motion to come out of camera. Okay, You're good. Great. So motion to come out of camera. Paul Clark, do you approve? Yeah. And Kevin? Yes. And Lynn? Yep. And Joss? Yes. Yes, and I approve. So motion's carried. Uh Jordy, you catch that? I did. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll um, I will just uh, read out the motion on the floor. The motion is to refuse development permit application number seventy three twenty one and require the dwelling construction to be altered so as to comply with development permit number zero seven twenty one. The reasons for the refusal are that there was extensive neighbor and community member objections the violations to the existing permit, the amendments are too different from the original approved development in terms of landscaping and drainage, slope stability concerns, and that no permit has been provided evidencing that a provincially approved system will be installed. Thanks, John. Okay, thanks, John. So before we, uh, before we vote, um, Kelly and Lane, have you heard that? And do you uh, do you wish to comment at this time, or Chris? <clears throat> um, yes, Kelly and Elaine have heard that. Um, yeah, I guess we'll just have to. Uh, uh, well, you'll be giving us uh, a letter or whatever tomorrow yeah. or the next day, I would assume, eh? So. Yeah, we'll just get the results of the letter and and deal with that. You've, and, uh, you've got the option, obviously, to appeal. I think yes. it's uh, I think it's a two week uh, window to okay. make the make the appeal application. Okay. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's go to the vote. So, motion to uh, to refuse. Uh, Paul Clark, do you approve? Yes. Yes. And Kevin. Yes. And Lynn? Yes. And Josh? Yes. And I approve, so motion's carried. Joy, did you catch that? I did. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Chris, that uh, you said that there'll be a document coming from um, from Jan. And uh, and uh, as I said, there is a window there for uh, for appeal. Okay. So I think that's uh, that's all we have on that application. We'll move on the agenda. 
Mr. Chairman, um, um, yeah. I'm going to have to leave this meeting. I've got another meeting starting at one o'clock. I don't think okay, there's Paul. anything. Of, of, I don't think there's anything that is controversial coming up. I think. No, I think, I think you're right. Okay. Thanks, and everybody. See you later. Bye, Paul. See you down Bye. the road. So we uh, we still have a quorum, so we'll just finish up the agenda. Uh, 5B, we have uh, one application processed uh, by the development officer. Any comments on there? Okay, if not, we'll accept that for information. We have no subdivision applications. We have no lease referrals. Uh, under new business, we've got... Um, Oh, this was the uh, this was the procedure for for um, virtual meetings, and that's the same as it was previously, right? Yeah. So we've we've all seen that, and um, and we we adjusted our uh, introductory notes last year to to make sure we um, accommodated this that we met those requirements. And we've got two council meeting minutes. I have one question. And, yeah. I know Josh is new, but maybe he knows the answer to this. So the land exchange deal with the province, is that all done and, or is it still in motion with council? I don't know. I can't okay. answer that. Sorry. Just came up with Burnco, so I was kind of curious to know if it's finalized or not. Maybe Jerry yeah. could answer that. I haven't received any notification that it's been finalized yet. So as far as I know, it has not been. Okay, thanks. Just curious. Thanks, sir. Any other discussion? Okay, so we'll uh, we'll accept that for uh, information. Um, we have nothing. So in camera is done. I guess uh, all that's left is to adjourn. So the motion I move adjourn. adjournment. Thanks, Kevin. So motion to adjourn. Uh, Kevin, do you do you yes. agree? Yes. Yes. And Lynn. Yes. And Joss? Yes. And I agree, so motion is carried. Meeting's adjourned. Uh, Joy, did you catch that? I did.